Hi there, my name is Will, and today I'm gonna to walk you through how to create your own apps inside of Kestra 0.20. Now, in case you missed it, apps is a great way to build custom UIs for your workflows, meaning that your workflow acts as the back end and your app acts as the front end. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through how you can create your own apps for your workflow, so let's jump into it. Now, jumping into Kestra, the first thing we need to do is create a workflow. I've got a couple of examples here that we can use. Now, to start with, I'm gonna use this one called My Flow. Now, inside of My Flow, it's a pretty straightforward workflow. It has one single input and one task. It's gonna take the input user, which is a string, and it has a default value called world. And then we're going to use that input in our task here, which is a log task, to output it to the logs. So we're gonna say hello, and then our input, which by default will be world. And if I execute this, we'll see the output like so in the terminal. Hello world, quite nice. Now, if we go back to editing our workflow, we now have this new tab at the top here called apps. Now, if you've already got an app, you'll be able to view it here, but if you don't, you can go over to the apps page here and create a new one, which is what we're going to do now. Now, when we first open this, it looks a little bit like our flows. The difference here is there are a few different properties. Now we have an ID and a namespace like we would expect to see in a workflow, but we also have a type, a display name, the flow ID that's gonna be related to this app and the access. For access, we can make this a completely public app so anyone can access it, or we can make it something that requires you to log in with your Kestra credentials to be able to access it, or you can make it private so no one can access it. You can also add a number of tags to make it easier to filter for them in the apps menu. Now, moving down is where the actual logic for our app is gonna be. And this is sort of where tasks is in our workflow, but instead we're gonna call this layout. And under layout, we have a bunch of different states. You can see here we have on open, on running, and on success. Now, this basically tells us what we want our app to do based on the different statuses of our workflow. Because at the end of the day, the app is just starting the workflow. So we've got different statuses for when you first open it, when it's running, when it succeeds, as well as when it fails, if it's paused, as well as when it's resumed. Let's get an example in here that's pre-made and ready to go for our simple MyFlow example. So here's an app for my flow. As you can see, I've set my flow ID and the namespace correctly, and I've got an ID for my app. Now I've given this my display name, so it's a little bit nicer for when people are interacting with it. And I've given it description so people understand what it's for. I can also add a tag, as you can see here. Now this has three states, very simply, we've got open, running, and success. Inside of these, we have blocks, and there are a number of different types of blocks you can use to really customize your apps. I'm gonna walk you through a couple of those and some of the properties that you have associated with them. Now, with this app, we have a block here called Markdown Block, which just allows us to add some text in here to be able to instruct the user what they need to do, whether that's pass in a specific type of file or add a certain text field, we can be specific with them using this markdown block. So I've just saved this app now, so I can now view this in a new tab. And here we can see we've got this title here saying create a new execution, a description underneath saying pass custom input value and execute the flow. Then we have the input itself with the predefined input inside of it and an execute button. So this is our on open status. Now, if we check out the code here, we can see that we've got that markdown block that has a title saying create a new execution followed by just a simple paragraph. And we can clarify that that's what the markdown block is doing. So the next block we have here is this create execution form. Now this is simply just going to create a form for our input values and put it straight in. So you haven't got to make them individually for each of the different inputs. And if you're using conditional inputs to be able to only display certain inputs based on previous ones, then that also will allow that to dynamically happen here without you having to configure that logic a second time. And then at the end, we can then put an execution button. So we can then start the workflow and we can say what style we want it to be, colors and stuff like that, how big, any text. So we've just kept it pretty simple here with a simple execute, nice and straightforward. Now let's scroll down to the next status, which is on running. Now again, we have a markdown block here with a title followed by a loading block and the logs block. So we can actually show the user the logs that are being produced by 
the workflow that's executing at the time. But we can actually filter by the logs and log level. So if we only want to show the user info logs, but we don't want to show them any debug logs, then this is really useful, especially if you're using some plugins where they produce a lot of debug and trace logs. And then we've added a cancel execution button here, again, where we can then specify the style and how we want it to look. So let's now click execute and see what this looks like. And see, we can see it's all in a cancel status. We can see the logs as well. And I think if we look at the success, we're gonna see a very similar sort of pattern that we saw here with the running, where we've got a markdown block here for the text. We've got ourselves the, uh, we've got another markdown block here for the execution log, which is this. On top of that, we also have the logs here, so we can see the final logs at the end of the execution. And then we've got a button here where we can specify the URL that we want that button to have. And in that example here it is more examples. We're just gonna open a GitHub repository, which we can see here. Now we can actually just go back to that original on open status and actually change the input in our flow to see them replicated here without having to then modify the app. So if I now view my flow and add a new input. So here I've just added a simple int input value here with a default value of 23. Now, if I refresh my app, we'll now see that is automatically added to the app. So it makes it very easy to be able to ask for those inputs. Next up, I'm gonna show another example. This one is called get data, and it's simply going to take two different inputs and then use that to then request data and then return an output. So in this example, we can actually return an output at that success status. Now, what we can do here is go over to the apps menu, and I actually have an app pre-made for this one already, which is this form to request and download data. And here we can actually see some of those tags I mentioned earlier, as well as the type of app. Now, if I click on the little dots in the corner here, I can view the details of my app, which is where I can then edit it. So let's have a look at that. Now, this one is also set to public, so we should be able to view this and send this link to anyone if we wanted them to fill out the form and then get data. Now, for the on open, we see a very similar setup to what we had with our previous app. We've got an execution form here to be able to get the inputs. We've got a button to start the whole thing, and we've got a bit of markdown to describe what's going on. And if I click save and then view this app, we can again see pretty similar to the last one we had. Moving down to on running, we can actually see it's fairly similar again, but this time we've got a slightly different content in the markdown box. We've got a loading block so we can show that it's doing things. We've got the logs again being produced and the cancel execution button so we can actually stop the workflow altogether. The key thing that becomes different here is the success state. Now here we wanna be able to display an output back, not just the logs and a button. So here, what we've got here is the type that shows the inputs that we used. And then we can see an alert here that says it was also successful. And it tells us that the content is ready to go. And then we've got a block here specifically displaying outputs. So we can see both those inputs and outputs, but maybe we only want to show the outputs. So we can remove the other block and only show the outputs. And then we've got another markdown one here to explain what's going on, help the user understand what has been produced, what these buttons mean. And then we are left with two extra buttons here. Now, again, we've got an add app examples one, which we had in the previous example, but here we've actually got an expression for this button, which allows you to then rerun the request again. And we're able to put the app URL directly in the button. It'll create a brand new instance of the app, which we can then use. And then very neatly at the bottom here, we also have a redirect. So we can say after 60 seconds, it should just redirect to another page to stop it just being a tab that stays open forever. So you could choose to do that if you wanted and specify the delay before it does it. So let's press save and view this app. So here I can select some different values from my inputs. I can select data set dates as well. And when I press submit, it looks very similar to before, but this is where it gets different. We can see inputs in a block here. As you can see, it's in a nice table. It's really easy to see. We can also see our outputs just like we would in the outputs page for our flow. But the key thing is it's all on one page here. All the extra clutter that's generated from a workflow execution is hidden away, making this really easy for maybe a non-technical user to be able to come in here, specify a couple of parameters, and then get the end result thereafter, which in this case is a CSV file that they can then use in a spreadsheet or whatever they need to do. I can can then preview this data here and I can have a look, but I can then also download it. And if I want to press that submit new request button, which we can actually see as a different format to the other one, we can see that this one has a style info and the other one has style default. So we can actually see that 
It does look a little bit different, which is nice for being able to differentiate the different buttons and their importance, whether it's a sort of positive action or a negative action. And I can press submit new request and we get open a new tab here with what we had before. And we can actually see that old page has actually redirected now to the docs like we specified after 60 seconds. We've got one final example here to demonstrate apps in action. Now here, we've got a number of different inputs. Now this is a little bit more complex because we're using conditional inputs, which allows us to have inputs rely on one another. So for example, if I was to say that I want resource type access permissions, it can then show me another input related to that. But if I select something else, it can hide that away and show me an input related to the other thing I selected. Just means that when I press this execute button, I'm not given like 20 different inputs. I'm only showing the ones that are relevant to me at that time, which just makes for a better experience for the user using it. Now we can actually replicate this in our app, which means that we can create that same great user experience in our app and we can customize how we want it to look to make it even better for the person who's gonna use this. Now we can see here that when I select different things, we get different types of uh, inputs appear. If I change this, we'll see that that changes to the development tools, cloud VM will change to cloud provider. You get the idea. Now this is going to collect a load of different inputs depending on what we select using the depends on property which is all part of the conditional inputs. Then we've got a couple of tasks here. It's going to send a Slack notification. It's going to uh, pause it and ask for approval. Now this is where it gets a little bit interesting because we talked about earlier that there is a status for apps that if a workflow gets paused, we can use that now because we're going to pause the workflow here. And then after all of that, and once it's been approved, it is then going to generate some data at the end here. And we're going to be able to see that in the end of our app. So. Let's now head over to the app, which I have pre-made. We can actually click on apps here and I can click on details, which will then open up the screen for editing my app. Now we can see here and I'll open the app so we can switch between the two. This looks pretty similar to, again, the start of our other two apps where it's basically just a bit of markdown describing what we want and the inputs themselves followed by a submit button. If we have a look down, we've actually got a second one here called created. So if we actually create the workflow, then we'll get another status for it to say that this request has been submitted. There is also a running status here that's gonna show similar to what we saw before with a loading block, logs being outputted and a cancel button. Now this is the new status, pause. So here we can specify our inputs to say what we were actually trying to request, which is quite useful because we basically said, these are the things I'm requesting, display those to the person who's gonna approve it. We can then use a markdown block to explain what all of this means and what needs to happen now. And then we're using a resume execution form and a resume execution button. And so let's have a look at what that looks like in a second. So I'm just gonna simply select access permissions. Say I want to be an admin. The deadline is tomorrow. And the reason is I need access. So now if I press submit, we're gonna see that it says, thank you for your submission. It's now on the loading screen. And now we've ended up at that pause state. And as you can see here, we've got the inputs. We've got a little bit of markdown telling us what's going on. And then here we've got the provisioning status. Now this is all part of the resume execution form. Now you're probably thinking, what's the difference between a resume execution form and resume buttons? Now, if I press the view flow for a second and scroll back down, when we pause the task on a resume, we actually expect two new inputs. So if I was to go to the execution that is paused, we actually have one from two days ago, I can use an example now. If I press resume, it asks me for some inputs that it needs to make decisions later on. You don't have to have inputs. The pause can simply just pause it and resume with no additional information. But in this case, we've asked for some new information. So what we've done in the app is effectively put in in here, those inputs at the pause task, followed by separate approve and reject buttons, which are effectively the resume button that we saw here. Resume and cancel is effectively the same thing. The key thing here is if I press cancel, it then kills it. And that's fine. That's what we'll expect from the approve and deny. But it's not super clear that when you press cancel, it's going to kill it because it's not really intended for that use case. Whereas the app here is designed for that approval use case, approval workflow. So let's go back to our example here and actually let's go back to the app so we can just com compare the code directly with it. So we'll click on details here. So if we just make this a little bit wider, we can see here that we can specify 
the different buttons, the resume execution button and the cancel. But we've been able to rename the text here to be a little bit more relevant to our specific use case. In this case, it's approve or reject. But in other cases, it might be that you want resume or cancel, depending on what you're doing. And once it resumes, we can see that it's then going to say thanks for validating the request, followed by a success, which is looking quite similar to our last example. Now, if it does fail because it's canceled for whatever reason, we can also show a bunch of different warnings. And as you can see, here, we can put an alert block and we can put some markdown blocks to explain what's going on to the user. And here we've got a nice little contact button, again, to help the user understand what they should do next. And if everything fails, we also have a fallback status here, basically saying, just put this message up if none of the statuses match. So for example, if you were to add a pause task to your workflow, but you didn't add the pause block into your app, then it would fall back onto this and basically go, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do right now. Please fix me so that it doesn't just crash. Based on all that, let's resume this workflow. So I'm gonna reject this request actually, and I'm going to click reject to the bottom here. And as you can see here, it has now fooled back and said, you're all set, thanks for using this app. If we do this again, this time with different, I'm gonna request Notion access. I press submit, we'll see that it's now loading again. We get approve and reject. So here, if I press approve, we can see that it's then going to get to the end here. We're gonna see the outputs block, the inputs block. We can view what we wanted, which was a catalog of data here, and we can submit a new request. So as you can see here, it's quite similar to building your workflows, but with some slightly different terminology. And so hopefully, at the end of this, you now have a fairly good idea how you can go away and build your own apps. Now, I'd recommend you check out the docs for the full list of functioning blocks that you can use. We're going to obviously keep we're going to continue to add more blocks. So we'd love to hear your feedback on what blocks you would like to see in apps to help you build apps for your use cases. And here is in the docs, we've got all of those different blocks available. I believe we covered all of these blocks today. If you wanna see all of the different properties and examples of how to use them, then I'd recommend checking out the docs. But you can also see inside of the app itself that when we click details, you can see when you click on it, just like when you're building a workflow, properties for that. Hopefully you can now go away and build your own app inside of Kestra. I'd love to hear how you're going to use apps inside of your use cases. So let us know in the comments below what you're gonna do with apps. Remember you can join our community on Slack where you can discuss with us further and make sure to give us a star on GitHub.